Good job, guys. Thank you. Speaking of joy, see that beautiful Choose Joy quilt over there? That was made uh, by the hands of a lady in our church. All right, anybody want to guess who it was? Yeah. <laughs> Emma Rowland. All right. And uh, you can get raffle tickets for that starting next week. The raffle will take place at the women's event September 1st. You don't have to be present to win it. You don't have to be a woman to buy a raffle ticket, all right? They will go on sale next week during the service. Don't forget, you can also uh, sign up for the event online. Okay, at, but, but that evening. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I don't care when you do it that night. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, yeah, 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 that's all right. You've been to Vegas, you're a little confused, so I understand. <laughs> Loss and heartbreak does that to us. <laughs> she was there visiting family, all right, she wasn't there gambling. <laughs> Much. Um... Man, you couldn't have picked a better song to kick off this morning's sermon. The whole subject of revival in that song sets the stage. Um, just some groundwork. If you're new, it's your first time here. Um, I don't often preach about hell. And I have to confess, I don't preach it often enough. I really don't. Um, it's not that you're probably going to start getting a steady diet of it or not, but um, I probably grew up in a period of time in which, in which preachers preached more on hell than they did on heaven. And so I've sort of swung the pendulum the other way, and much of my generation has. And um, just as you can preach too much about hell and not enough about heaven, I think we can also preach too much about heaven and not enough about hell. Um, I look forward to preaching about heaven. I dread preaching about hell. Mark, one of our uh, guitar players up here, looked out at me, wanted to know if I was okay. I didn't think my demeanor showed the fact that I was dreading preaching this morning. Um, it's, a, it's a scary subject. And it's one that I want to preach in such a way that it draws you to Jesus rather than sends you running from Jesus. When we talk about truth, there used to be, um, there used to be a challenge that was given in a courtroom. Do you promise to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? When we preach from this book, our challenge is to preach the whole book. To preach anything less would be an injustice. But it doesn't mean we have to enjoy some of the parts that we have to preach about. And that's where I am today. We've been on hell actually for two weeks. We are going to wrap this up today. Come hell or high water. <laughs> I want to take you back in history for a moment. I want, to, I want to teach you a history lesson. Some of you may have heard this. Some of you may have never heard this. I don't know if they teach much anymore in public school history lessons about the period of time in the 1700s that was referred to as the Great Awakening. That was a critical time in the nation that you and I are a part of, and yet, because it has such strong spiritual implications, though it revolutionized our country, it often gets overlooked these days. But I want to tell you about a one small but yet very powerful moment in that period of time in our history. I want to go back 277 years in one month. 277 years in one month. It was on July 8th, 1741. That was even before Dad was born. <laughs> he was not born till the 11th of July. 
Jonathan Edwards, who eventually became the president of what later became known as Princeton University. But Jonathan Edwards was a Presbyterian pastor. And he started a sermon on July the 8th, 1741, that he never would finish preaching. The fires of the Great Awakening were burning brilliantly throughout the New England states. Author Ian Murray writes these words about that period of time. He says, as spring passed into summer of 1741, no one could well keep track of the number of places which were witnessing revival in this country. Churches in some cases had been cold and dry at the beginning of the year, but they were being transformed by summer. It's astonishing, wrote Edwards, to see the alteration that there is in some towns where before there was little appearance of faith. Edwards' sermon, entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that message did not occur in a vacuum. By the way, there's not many sermon titles you can Google and find something pop up. You can Google sinners in the hands of an angry God and you will get pages of places that will pop up. You can read the entire manuscript of that sermon that he did not finish that day because Edwards wrote his sermons out completely. He didn't always stick to them, but he wrote them out completely. The sermon did not occur in a vacuum. There was wide revival occurring at this time. But it's more important to understand that the place where Edwards preached this sermon, it's important to know that up until the moment when Edwards preached, this town was distinctively resistant intentionally to revival breaking out. While towns all around it were being converted, one church, just one town away, had had 95 people come to know Jesus on a Sunday morning. The town of Enfield was becoming notorious for resisting the grace and the work of God at that time. Edwards had preached this sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, before. That night was not his first time. He had preached it at Northampton, his own home church. The night that he preached in his own home church, there were no reported astonishing manifestations or responses or emotions at the time of the first delivery. But now he's come to preach it in the town of Enfield, this town holding out against revival. And oh my, did God bless that night in an extraordinary way. One historical writer has it that Edwards was not even the designated preacher for that event. He was not the one who had been invited to preach that day. He became the stand-in. Such is the strange workings of the providence of God who works all things together for good. A group of pastors entered the meeting house at Enfield where the sermon was to be preached. As one participant later recalled, when the ministers entered the church at Enfield, the gathered people were thoughtless and vain. By comparison with other towns at that time, the people there were not even showing interest in what was about to happen, let alone any passion for God. In fact, they hardly conducted themselves with common decency. Sounds like they were kind of a rude crowd. This was not an auspicious beginning for revival to break out. There was no atmosphere of readiness. There was no seriousness. And there wasn't even normal polite awareness that something could possibly happen that would be good. But then Edwards began to preach the sermon. A sermon that would go down in history. We don't exactly know the style that Edwards used to preach. There was no video recordings or audio recordings at that time of his style. Any idea we have of technique has only come from what was reported way back then, 277 years ago. Some said he was, had a visual problem and he leaned over the podium and that he never left his manuscript. I don't know if that's true or not. 
Others have said he was one who would stick to his manuscript till he had an idea and then he would move away and preach a while, freed from his notes, and then always come back to them. But Samuel Hopkins, in his book, The Life of President Edwards, gives us a famous set of descriptions of Edwards' preaching style. Edwards was known in that day as the eminent preacher. Hopkins says he was known that for three principal reasons. First, Jonathan Edwards took great pains in composing his sermon. He worked hard on them. He wrote most of his sermons in their entirety. Second of all, his great acquaintance with God and God's divinity, his study and knowledge of the Bible, his extens extensive and universal knowledge of God and the things of the world enabled him to clearly articulate his thoughts. The third reason he was such a good preacher is his great acquaintance with his own heart, his own inward sense of shortcomings, the relish of divine things. This gave him a great insight into human nature. He knew that within each of us could be found both sinner and saint. Hopkins added his delivery was easy, natural, but usually very solemn. It was reported many times that on that day in Enfield, the crying and weeping from those who were listening became so loud that Edwards was forced to discontinue the sermon. There's a line, there's a line in that passage of that sermon it says, imagine yourself hanging by a thread over the pits of hell and the scissors are about ready to close. Articles I've read says it's at that moment that the crying and the wailing began that people literally said that under their feet they could feel the heat of the flames. On this day in history, July the 8th, 1741, Jonathan Edwards started a sermon he never would finish. That was the impact of his preaching that day and the response of people listening as they cried out to be saved. Instead of him finishing the sermon and opening up an altar call, it says the pastors on the stage flooded the audience and they began to pray with large groups of people to invite Jesus Christ. An infield which had resisted revival burst forth in revival. One particular author recanting the story of that night in Enfield says there are two observations I want to make about this sermon. Number one, preachers even today should not be afraid to preach on hell. I suggest to you that our generation of church will look back on this age and will probably remember it is one of the strangest fashions of preaching we've ever been through where we preached almost exclusively on the love of God and very little on the justice of God. We don't have a lot of biblical balance today, I think, in that area. The second thing he observed is, is that we should preach with imagery. Edward's sermon is astonishing for its sustained use of arresting verbal images. Your, this is one of the lines out of the sermon. Your wickedness makes you as if you are heavy as lead. And if God should let you go, you would sink swiftly and plunge into the bottomless gulf. Preachers are to be artists, rendering visual words about the glory of Jesus they represent and also the horrors that hell represents. With that history lesson as a background, let me make some final observations out of the scripture about hell for you today. Over the past two weeks, our primary source of information has come out of the Gospel of Luke chapter 16. We certainly will be making reference to that today. If this is a subject that you want to do more study on, and you always ought to check what the preacher says out of the Bible on your own. Don't take my word for it that this is what the Bible says about hell. Investigate it. So have a
pen and paper ready, write down these passages that I'm going to throw out. I don't have time for us to turn to each of them this morning. I will quote most of them. I will give you the location, but you check it out on your own and see if it bears witness with the truth of Scripture. The first observation I want to make today is that hell is a physical location. Like heaven, hell has an address. In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, hell is described as being far away. Luke chapter 16, verse 23. And it tells us in verse 24 that this physical location of hell consists of flames. And it also says it is separated from heaven by a great chasm, verse 26. These phrases describe an actual loca location. This is not a state of mind, as some want us to think that heaven and hell is going to be. It's just a state of mind, and a state of mind will be pleasant, and a state of mind will be uncomfortable. No, this is a physical place. Revelation 19.20, Revelation 20, verse 10, and verses 14 and 15, John describes hell as the lake of fire. At the end of the final judgment, before the unveiling of the new heaven and the new earth, John observed these words in verse 14. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Only a physical place, Hades, can be thrown into another physical place called the lake of fire. Jesus' own words in Matthew 25, verses 32 through 46, about the separation of the sheep and the goats. They strongly argue for the fact that hell is a geographical place. The scripture in Matthew 25, Jesus himself says, we will separate believers referred to as sheep and non-believers in Jesus Christ referred to as goats. He said the goats will go away into eternal punishment, hell, while the sheep will go into eternal life, verse 46. It is simply illogical for Jesus to say that believers go to an actual location called heaven while unbelievers are dispatched to an unpleasant state of mind called hell. Elsewhere in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus leaves no doubt about the reality of hell when he describes unbelievers in verse 41 as being accursed and cast into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Though hell and its flames are real, the fires of hell will not consume the bodies or the spirits of those who are sent there. Rather, unbelievers will suffer physical and spiritual anguish for all eternity. So hell is a physical location. Second of all, hell is a place of eternal physical torment. The Bible teaches that the bodies of everyone who has ever lived, Christian and non-Christian alike, all of us will experience a resurrection. Christians will receive a new body that will allow them to enjoy the indescribable pleasures of a new heaven and a new earth. And unbelievers will inherit a body that will allow them to experience the eternal suffering of a place called hell. If you have difficulty believing that God would give non-believers a new body for the sole purpose of experiencing everlasting suffering, then read carefully the words of Jesus himself in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Jesus said, Do not marvel. Don't be surprised at this. The hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear the voice of the Son of God. And they will come forth and those who did good to a resurrection of life, and those who did evil to a resurrection of judgment. John saw this future resurrection of the unsaved in his vision in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And that passage reads like this. John said, Then I saw a great white throne, and the one who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the book, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. So if you got buried at sea, no problem for God. If you're buried in the ground or in a tomb, no problem. If you're burned up in a fire, no problem. The sea gave up their dead, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one, 
according to their deeds. Then their death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he's been thrown into the lake of fire. I've had people over the years ask me, Tim, do you believe that hell is really a lake of fire? I'm going to give you a great answer. I don't know. <laughs> but don't let that answer diminish what I believe hell is like. See, just as heaven is described to us as streets of gold and gates of pearl, I don't know if there's literally going to be streets of gold. There could be. This is God's plan. There could be gates of pearl. I don't, here's what I do know. That in the time that this was written, that was the most extravagant thing that the writers could come up with to talk about the glory of heaven, gold and pearl. They had seen the great, the, the, the great temples that had been built out of gold and silver. But the Bible says that the eye has not seen nor the mind imagine how incredible heaven will be. So the best description we can give in human language will pale in comparison to how incredible heaven is. That being true about heaven, the same thing I believe will be true about hell. The most visual description that authors of that time and culture could come up with to describe the horrors of hell was the word we briefly talked about last week, Gehenna. The fiery pit of the garbage dumping grounds outside the city of Jerusalem that burned day and night as citizens came out, poured their garbage, and the lepers would live in some of the, the small caves on the side of the hill going down to the bottom of the valley, and as garbage was dumped over, they would snatch bits of food and items of clothes, and that's how they survived. Lepers in a burning valley. And that is the word that the New Testament used to describe a lake of fire. And as bad as that is, it will not compare to how bad it will be. So when I say, I don't know if it'll be a literal fire, don't think that diminishes my view that hell exists and it is as horrible and beyond what we can imagine. Now some theologians have attempted to rescue God from the charge of cruel and unusual punishment by advancing a doctrine of annihilation this belief theorized, theorizes that unbelievers are destroyed or annihilated instead of punished for eternity. One of the arguments proponents of annihilation use is the fact that Jesus and Paul speak of the destruction of those who go to hell. But the Greek word destruction, olethros, doesn't mean annihilation. It means sudden ruin. It refers to separation from God and the loss of everything in life that's worth living for. As a pastor, I have frequently witnessed this kind of destruction. For example, when a person, either a husband or a wife, through adultery or an alcoholic, through their addiction, destroys the dignity of the family life, the suffering they experience is not, not momentary, but continues long after. The doctrine of annihilation contradicts the clear teaching in Revelation chapter 19, verses 20, and chapter 20, verse 10 where it tells us that after the return of Jesus Christ, the false prophet and the Antichrist are thrown into the eternal lake of fire. And Satan and his minions are also cast into this lake of fire. Verse, 20, verse 10 in chapter 20 says, The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the Antichrist and the false prophet are also thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. Notice the phrase, where the beast and the false prophet are. If the Antichrist and the false prophet have been destroyed at the moment they were cast into the lake of fire, John wouldn't have written where the beast and the false prophet were. Because they still are. They're there. The phrase forever and ever is important because it reiterates Jesus' claim that hell is a place of eternal punishment. It's also important because it's the exact same phrase used by John to describe the endless worship and praise of God in heaven and the endless kingdom of God that is ours to enjoy. Dr. Criswell, who used to be the pastor of Dallas First Baptist Church, used to observe that if you reduce by one minute the time unbelievers have in hell, then we must logically subtract that same amount of time 
the believers have in heaven since the phrase forever and ever is used to describe the experience of both believers and non-believers. The next observation about hell is it is a place of indescribable loneliness. Many people joke that they'd rather go to hell than go to heaven because hell will be party central. But there will be no parties in hell, folks. You can say things like, hey, I'm just going to go hang out with my buddies. I'm sorry, there'll be no hanging out. There'll be no socialization in hell because no one will be able to see anyone or anything. Jesus described hell as a place of outer darkness. It's a place without the light of Christ because everyone in hell will be away from the presence of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 1.9. I think I told this story in one of the very first uh, sermons on heaven. So let me ask, I'll, I'll get an opinion whether I should tell it or not. It's a good illustration of what I'm talking about here. How many of you heard me tell the story of the politician who got to go to choose between heaven and hell after he died? Okay, who didn't hear it? Raise your hand. I need to see if I... Should I tell it? Okay. I really had to twist my arm on that one. There's a politician who died, and he got to the pearly gates, and Peter said, uh, Mr. Politician, we have a policy here now that before we can let you enter to heaven, you have to spend 24 hours in hell. And the politician said, I don't want to go to hell. And then Peter said, well, you don't have a choice. 24 hours in heaven, hell, 24 hours in heaven, then you can choose where to spend eternity. Now, that part is not biblical. So he gets in the elevator. The doors open up. The politician looks into a beautiful grand ballroom. All the guys are dressed in tuxes. All the girls in nightgowns are dancing. He looks over and there's his best buddies at the bar and they're toasting his arrival. And for the next 24 hours, the politician has a grand time in hell. 24 hours pass just like that in that party atmosphere and then he's back in the elevator. Gets to heaven, the doors open up. It is the most beautiful grand thing he's ever seen in his life. He's never seen mountains so high, sky so blue, water so beautiful. And in the next 24 hours, he is so much at peace. He is so rested. He can't believe that it was over just like that. And St. Peter pops up in front of him and says, Okay, time to choose, heaven or hell. The politician rubs his chin for a moment and he says, you know, this is a tough choice. But he said, I, I, I've got so many friends in hell, I think I'll have a lot more in common and, and, and I think I'm going to choose hell. Peter said, are you sure? Politician says, yes. Okay, back in the elevator. <laughs> Doors open to his surprise. It's not a grand ballroom. It's not men and women dressed to the nines. It's not his buddies toasting his arrival. What he looks out into is a barren wasteland. No one is talking to each other. It's like they can't even see each other. They're dressed in rags. There's a garbage bag over every one of their shoulders. There's a pickup stick, and they all are endlessly picking up trash, putting in the bag, sweat flowing profusely from their face. And the politician looks at Satan and says, whoa, 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 time out, buddy. This is not what I saw 24 hours ago. What's the deal? And Satan says, sir, 24 hours ago, we were campaigning for your vote. Today, we've got it. <laughs> Now that sad illustration tells us the reality of hell and unfortunately probably the reality of politics as well. <laughs> but see the fact is there'll be no party in hell. My graduation year at Fresno Pacific in 1978, communication class I was in, the professor took us on a field trip and we went to a cave about 15, 20 miles outside of Visalia. Our class of about 15 students, along with a professor and an, uh, I think his spouse was with us. We, uh, we climbed the side of a hill, we entered a cave, and we walked about three quarters of a mile in to the side of the mountain. We got into a room that opened up into a good sized uh, cavern. Uh, we all had lights. They asked us to sit down in a circle. Please take note of where the people are to our right or our left. And he said, now what we're going to do next is we're going to have our lunch. We all had a bag lunch. And it said, on your bag, so read what you have, so you know what's in your bag. Uh, it tells you what's in there. You might have a bologna sandwich, you might have a ham sandwich, you might have a and j But take note of what you have. You'll have a different kind of bag of chips. Notice what you've got. You've got a beverage. Please take note of what it is. You all are going to, please feel free during your lunch hour to exchange what you have for what somebody else has if it's to your benefit. But you have to do it with all the lights off. So three quarters of a mile into the side of a hill, we all turned our lights off. 
Of course, the first part of the test was we had to really work on communication skills because I had to know the person's name to my right and to my left. I had to try to remember where everybody was. And if somebody on the far side had what iPhone ordered for lunch, I had to negotiate. And the negotiation had to take place all the way around the circle to move things around. And then we ate lunch. After lunch was finished was part two of this, this field trip. And part two was for the next, uh, we want you to get comfortable, get settled into where you are, get as comfortable as you can because for the next 15 minutes, I do not want you to move at all. Don't reach up and scratch your nose. Don't change positions. Remain absolutely still for the next 15 minutes. Do not say a word. I think they even said something like, don't even breathe if you can keep from it. Another word, absolute silence. 15 minutes. And an absolutely, I put my hand right here after the lights went out. I could not see it. Did not even know it was there. After about eight minutes, one of the girls in our group finally yelled out, Is anybody still here? <laughs> there was this sense of fear that everyone had somehow departed the cavern. This close to people next to you on each side, and yet absolute loneliness. That is something of what hell must be like for those who enter there, an abyss, the Bible says, of darkness. Hell is also a place of no return. It's a forever destination. That's the point of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Once we die, our eternal destinies are just that. They are eternal. Novelist James Joyce in a book called A Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man, captures a hint of the hopelessness and despair that hell must know. After describing for his congregation the suffering that takes place in hell, the pastor in this book declares this in his sermon, Consider finally the torment of an infernal prison is increased by the company of the damned themselves. In hell, all laws are overturned. There is no thought of family or country, of ties or relationships. The damned howl and they scream at one another. Their torture and rage intensified by the presence of being tortured and raged from those who were next to them. The yells of the suffering sinners fill the remotest corners of this vast abyss. The mouths of the damned are full of blasphemies against God and of hatred for their fellow sufferers and curses against those souls which they come accomplices in their sin. They turn upon those accomplices and upbraid them and curse them, but they are helpless and hopeless. It is too late for repentance. No one escapes the kind of confine of hell once since there, sent there. If you wait until you enter the gates of hell to repent, you will have waited too long. I think for me it's this next point that is the most disturbing. Hell will be the destiny of the majority of humanity. Many people believe that hell is for the truly evil people, the Hitlers and Stalins and Potts and Mansons and Bin Laden of the world. These same people find it inconceivable that many good people who've simply not trusted in Jesus for forgiveness would also be sentenced to eternal torment. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus taught that only a small percentage of the earth's population will choose the true path of eternal life. Jesus said it like this, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. There are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who walk through it. It's not impossible. It's not hard to find. It's the willingness to choose. Am I going to go? It, it's peer pressure. Oh, so many are walking life like this. I think I'll just walk right along with them. But right there, there's a gate for you and I to choose from. As difficult as it may to be accept. The many on the wide road are not just mass murderers and child rapists and terrorists. Such religious people who make good neighbors and love their children are also on the highway to hell. Even people who claim they have performed religious works in the name of Jesus Christ will be cast into hell by Jesus on Judgment Day. For Jesus himself revealed in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father will enter heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I do miracles? Under your name? 
Sounds like a lot of TV evangelists to me. And Jesus said, I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We struggle with Jesus' claim that the majority of people will go to hell because of our low estimation of God. Listen to this next line. I wish I'd written it. I wish I knew who wrote it. But he's right on the money. We assume that God should be as tolerant of sin as we are. See, after all, you and I regularly overlook sin in ourselves as well as in others. And so we say, so why can't God? But we must remember, God was not made in our image. We were made in His image. Our tolerance of sin is not evidence of our godliness. Our tolerance of sin is the evidence of our godlessness. Listen to God's indictment of the Israelites in Psalm 50, 21 when he says, You thought I was just like you. God isn't anything like us. His eyes are too pure to approve evil. And he will not look on wickedness with favor. Habakkuk 1.13 And for that reason... God must and will punish sin. Every sinner has an opportunity to receive Christ's offer of forgiveness. To do so means heaven. And every sinner has an opportunity to reject Christ's offer of forgiveness. And to do so means hell. God's standard is perfect holiness. And that standard is Son, Jesus Christ. And none of us meet that standard apart from Him. And because we don't, Paul said, all have what? Sinned. And we've fallen where? Short of the glory of God. That is why we need Jesus. Christian philosopher Peter Kreeft was correct when he said, hell is not populated mainly by passionate rebels, but by nice, bland, indifferent, respectable people who simply never gave a damn about Jesus. I believe for those of us, not because of our good works or our good deeds, but because of our faith in receiving the work of Jesus Christ into our own life, we will be so preoccupied with the joys of heaven that the horrors of hell will no longer disturb us. But folks, while we still have breath on this earth, the horrors of hell ought to disturb us. I've tried to imagine this past week my worst enemy. I've tried to imagine this past week the person or persons who have hurt me the most. That maybe in my weakest moment I would love to see revenge fall upon them. And I must be honest. I do not wish hell on a one of them. Shouldn't that motivate us to share with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors, the love of Jesus Christ. Guys, I'm not so sure that hell should motive us to say everybody we run into, if you died tonight, do you know if you'd go to hell or heaven? I'm not saying that's the best approach. But I am saying for us as the church, I think because we haven't thought about hell enough, we are not motivated appropriately to share this incredible gift that we have been given that we didn't deserve with someone else. These are eternal destinies. Most of you live in a place you call home. Whether it is your house that you're buying, a house you've paid for, or something you're renting from somebody else, it is a place that you have chosen to call home for now. Some of you have chosen where you live or how you live based upon your economic situation at the moment. Often we wish for something more. We settle for something less. The best less we can afford. 
Here's the deal, folks. Your eternal home is one of two choices. Economics has nothing to do with it. You can live in the glories of heaven and it doesn't cost you one dime because it cost Jesus Christ his son. Or you can live in forever poverty and torment. No matter how much you owned in this world, it doesn't pay for your exit out of hell and into heaven. You will choose where you live by your choice of him. If you have never invited Christ in your life, would you want to wait one minute longer inviting him in knowing that you can avoid hell by admitting that you were a sinner, that Jesus is your Savior, and you want heaven to be your forever home? Maybe some of you who came here today for the very first time, you had no idea hell was going to be dumped on you today. Could I suggest that you look at it slightly differently? That heaven has been offered to you today? Why don't you bow with me as we pray? And if you've never invited Christ in your life, why don't you do that right now? Tim, I don't know what to say. No magic formula. God, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Thank you for your son. That he did it for me. And I don't understand all that, but I understand enough to know I want him. And I can't wait to learn more about him. Someone who would do this for me at no cost. I can't wait to get to know him more. Let's pray. For those of us who are already believers in Jesus, we know we're going to heaven. But maybe you've been challenged today and maybe there are some names pressing hard in your mind. Oh, I need to share my faith with them. Why don't you pray for the courage to take that first step, make that next move, whatever that may look like in this encounter. But don't waste any more time. Our Father, thank you that you hear our prayers. God, I'm sorry that I'm sorry that you had part of your heavenly host rebel against you in creation. God, I'm sorry that the one you made in your image chose to rebel against you. But I am so grateful that you did not allow their rebellion to stop your love for us. But love has reached down in the person of your son, the Lord Jesus, with all that is necessary to escape hell and to possess heaven. And if there's someone who's here this morning that has never, they, they've sat on the fence or they've thought just because they live in America or they've attended church a few times or their parents are active, that, that, that they're going to sneak in. But today they've discovered that there's a small gate and a, a, narrow, a narrow walkway that leads to heaven. Not, not hard to find, but it does require a choice. It requires getting off a road of comfort and a road of familiarity. And by faith, stepping on a road that leads to a place beyond our wildest imaginations. So, Father, thank you for those who are praying right now. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin and my rebellion against you. Thank you that your son did everything that needs to be done so that I can inherit heaven as my forever home. And God, I can't wait to grow in a knowledge of you in the years to come. Thank you for hearing their prayers. And just like that, they become your child. Thank you for motivating us to share our faith with those we love and even those we don't love so much because hell is such a horrible place to spend eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.